How you spend your money is, in many ways, how you spend your life. So how can you generate not just a return on your investments, but a return on life? Welcome to the Own Your Wealth Podcast. Whether you're a working professional, a small business owner, or thinking about retirement, listen in as host Jason Deshays of Cook Wealth discusses tax strategy, financial planning, and more to equip you to live life empowered and truly own your wealth. Welcome and thank you for joining us today on Own Your Wealth with Jason Deshays. I'm Wendy McConnell. Hi, Jason. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing great. It's a little rainy today so it's kind of that dreary early or say what late winter early spring thing but you know what it's nice and toasty in here so i can't complain i was gonna say you don't seem somebody to me that would get the uh winter dreary doldrums you seem no, very no. um above that shall we say more so i don't notice it unless <laughs> it's like constant where it's like i'm literally living in some sort of post-apocalyptic like, mess uh, like it's seattle. otherwise it's fine yeah like seattle so Okay, so we have a guest today. Exciting stuff, huh? Oh, I'm very excited for our guest today. This is Dave McDougall. He is the Chief Advisory Officer here at Cook Wealth. Uh, he and I collaborate a ton on a lot of clients, a lot of the leadership. He's part of our leadership team here uh, at Cook Wealth, and he's just a stellar person. And I think we'll be bringing some real nuggets here that our listeners will really enjoy. Hey, Appreciate Dave. That, Jason. Hey, hey, Wendy. Hey, Jason. Yeah, they're happy to be here. Yeah, similar kind of, you know, I'm in the same spot as Jason. So, you know, I had a similar experience with the weather this morning, but it doesn't bother me too much either. So we maybe need to get one of those, uh, one of those lights here in the office to, uh, to kind of uh, combat the, uh, the winter blues, but the tanning light. Uh, uh, what are they? Some people have them. They, uh, they sort of, they represent the sun a little bit. So what they'll do is they'll uh, make people feel a little bit better when, uh, when, you know, the sun goes down at three o'clock. Dave, I was thinking you were wanting to give a tanning booth in here. I mean, that'd be great. Hey, we'd have you know, that. Hey. We'd all be nice and bronze for all the people. And they're like, man, you must get out a lot and must have a real good life balance at Cook Wealth if you guys can be that bronze <laughs> all the time. So, oh, no, that's the tanning booth in the back. You know? Yeah, I think clients expect us to look look a certain way. A little that's, pale. That's, that's probably what they, <laughs> what they expect. So, yeah, yeah. So Dave is here today to uh, yes. kind of let us know how wonderful and fabulous Cook Wealth is. Some of the differences between some of the places that you guys have been in partnership with in the past compared to what is going on here at Cook yeah. Wealth. Yeah, and, I, and Dave, I think one of the things I want to start with is you kind of came, you came from Cook Wealth from a very different environment, and, what, sure. and but it's probably what most people would understand as being the norm in the industry. And I think one of the things that we'd like to kind of talk through is like, what does that look like for most people? What's their general experience? What was your experience in that? And then how did it come over when you came over to Cook Wealth? Like, what is that different for you? And then, and we'll kind of talk a little about how that came from my, where I used to be in my life and how that's kind of fused in something better for, I think our clients as a whole. Sure. Yeah. So, so Dave, what was your life before? What was your, can of give us a day in the world of Dave McDougall, financial advisor at your kind of prior career locations? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I had, uh, you mentioned something before you said, Hey, you know, what most people think is what financial planning is and what most people have experience with. It's also the place that most financial advisors do start out. And so I have a very similar journey to I feel like a lot of advisors have. Uh, so I had a longstanding relationship, a longstanding, you know, one of the big financial planning firms. And I had a very, very short, and I'll kind of explain that later, a very short tenure at a uh, another, you know, smaller firm, more insurance based. But yeah, started out, you know, at a, at a company that I interned with in the, the summers before when I was in school and I was in college. And, you know, I would never say anything disparagingly about the company. They uh, were a great place to start. They were a great place to, you know, learn the industry. And they did put a lot of time and resources into me with getting my licenses and everything that needed to uh, needed to be done to, to bring me up to speed to, to being an advisor. Um, within about four or five years, I started into a client facing role. And that's always what I wanted to do. It's always what I, I, I have a passion to help people in terms of financial planning. I truly believe that we are providing a service that really everybody needs uh, and it's a partnership that everybody should have um, and they don't teach this in school 
right? So this is something that, you know, you don't take a class on it. I mean, it's so important. So I was really, really happy to be part of that uh, role. And I, I did it for a while. I was in a client facing advisory role for about five years and I really enjoyed it. But what I realized while I was there is that while yes, a lot of the role is focused on relationship building and helping the clients, um, it's a big firm and it's, it is what it is. It's very, very sales focused. It's the definition of success for myself and as an advisor was, you know, what my numbers were, what my sales mm-hmm. numbers were. So whether that's and money sales, coming in. sales being things like, was it products? Was it new relationships? Was it money that was coming and flowing through the coffers? Like walk, walk through that a little bit. What were you measured on? Because I, I think that's what most people are like, well, wait, what does that mean for the advice then? If you're measured on these things here, does that mean I get better invite advice or am I getting something skewed to make the number go a certain way? Sure, absolutely. So the main two things that I was measured on, right, is money coming in, not necessarily new households, but more just money coming in called flows, and then how you develop those flows. So development of the flows essentially means what products you're putting it into. And that's really what they were. It was products. And, you know, the products that, made the company more money were the products that effectively made us more money. So I was paid a salary, but a lot of my compensation was commission-based and it was contingent on the products that I was selling. So, you know, a lot of what I was, you know, my definition of success, if I was a successful advisor, that's, you know, it was, it was contingent or not contingent. It was measured upon the money that came in and how I was developing those assets. So give me an example of the product that you're talking about. Are you talking about certain uh, places to put yeah, money exactly. and investments? Like, so is it, what is it more specifically? So, yeah. So, so really this firm is a little bit different where, not different, it's like a lot of how companies are. The advisors, excuse me, the clients had the option to sort of self-direct, kind of manage the money on their own. And they sort of had a advisor that they could talk to if they had some questions, but it really wasn't built to really get self-directed advice. It just wasn't. Um, but the products essentially were managed products uh, and annuities and insurance products. So it was- and, and Insurance IRA, being life insurance, insurance being life insurance, permanent life insurance terms. Things like that, right? So this is going to be, I'm meeting with a client, you know, they just changed jobs, let's say, and they want to go ahead and they want to move over their, they have a 401k. What would essentially- pay me what essentially what I would get paid on is that money coming over in terms of like, you know, rolling over that 401k into an IRA. And then after that, putting that money into a managed, potentially an annuity, if they needed some sort of protection of their assets, if they needed some sort of lifetime income or, you know, income in retirement is putting it into an annuity like that. And then every few months, there was sort of a a product of the quarter, a product of the month where you know, we were incentivized to sort of sell those certain products. So, so this is this is like a disability quarter for the year. Let's sure. see who can sell enough of these policies out yep. there. Now, Dave, uh, even before I was in this industry, to me, that would seem like a conflict of interest where it's like, hey, person, you need blah. And you're going to get whether you truly or not, but I'm really got the Jones to sell this because I got to get my my numbers up. Is that, do you think that's something that people feel like they're getting maybe pushed or that's maybe some bias in the, in this, from the client's perspective that is just really not best for them. And maybe that's why people have a little apprehension when they start hearing about financial planning and like, well, you're just going to sell me something. I think that that is a big, I think that's a big reason why financial advisors sort of get the reputation that we do. And it's, just exactly like what you were mentioning, you know? So I'm a certified financial planner. Jason, you're a certified financial planner. So you know that that means that, you know, one of the biggest parts of that is that we have to act, act as fiduciaries. So we have to put our client's interest ahead of our own. It's very difficult to do that when you're sitting in a sales meeting and this comp- the company has come up with a new annuity that they put a lot of time, a lot of resources in, and there's a lot of vested interest in selling those annuities. It's very difficult to sit into you're sitting in a sales meeting and your boss says, Hey, here's a new annuity that's come out. This happened a bunch of times. We have this new annuity. This is how it works. By the end of the week, I want you to identify 20 clients that could use this. And you know, they would do that. They give you an arbitrary number, come up with this. Uh, it's very hard to sit in front of that next client. Think about that sales meeting. Think about, I need to identify 20 clients by the end of the week that need this. 
and not position that whether they need it or not. So it's very difficult to do that. I would say that it's uh, it's in the back of every advisor's mind, effectively what you know what your numbers are, what your sales goals are, and you know they were monthly goals, they were quarterly goals, and you need to be able to hit all of those. And those are in the back of your mind every interaction you have with a client. So does that mean that the former company was not a fiduciary? So it doesn't necessarily mean that because they did stress that hey, you need to you know every every advice that you give, all the advice that you give needs to be suitable, right? So, But that's where you had acted, hand, hats, right? You had your yeah. like fiduciary hat, you had your sales hat, yeah. and you kind of just changed those out. They, and then like... I would say that, uh, Wendy, I would say that they more focused it on, on suitability um, instead of, you know, being a fiduciary. So effectively, every guidance, every advice, every recommendation that we would give would have to be a suitable one. You know, really what that meant was that if we gotten, you know, our regulatory industry gave us some sort of, let's say an audit, we would have to be able to defend that and say that it's suitable. And, you know, I worked with some really great advisors and I'm not saying that I didn't. And I would say that the majority of the recommendations that were given were suitable, but there's beyond that is being acting in a fiduciary standpoint and truly, truly giving recommendations that are within the best interests of the client and do not have any, you know, sort of conflicts of interest. And a lot of the times when you have goals that you need to meet and we were stack ranked against the other advisors. So that's sort of another, Darren and Jason, I'm sure you're probably going to get to this at, at a later time, but you know, what also makes Cookwell's different is that, you know, we work in what's known as an ensemble practice. And really what that means is that, yeah, I have my own clients that I'm responsible for. I'm the relationship manage- manager for, but because my definition of success is not what those clients bring in terms of money and how we develop those assets in terms of like how we, what products we sell, because that's not my definition of success. I'm able to bring in other advisors uh, that have different skill sets than I do. You know, we have some people here that are really, really good at taxes. Some people are fantastic when it comes to the investments. I'm able to bring them in because when the client, when the firm does better, all, uh, all ships, what is it? All ship size and uh, with the tide is kind of how we operate where, my last company it was very much in silos, right? You were working with your own clients, bringing in your own money and trying to sell the products that you were selling. You were kind of on your own and you're stack ranked against the other advisors too. So, you know, I wasn't able to bring in another advisor to go ahead and help me out because they had to go ahead and do their own thing. You know, it was sort of a, there was some competition there and I didn't like that either. And that, that always left a bad taste in my mouth. So. What really confuses me, though, and I'd like to get a little more clarification is uh, the difference between the fiduciary hat and the sales hat. And how do we know as a client which one would be worn at any given time? Sure. Was it an actual hat? Do we actually have like a... (laughs) Like yeah, a big you have F to put on the hat, yeah. Or an S, and well, then they're all good. You got the sales hat on. would be able to identify that. <laughs> so, if you are working with a certified financial planner, then that certified financial planner has to act within a fiduciary standpoint. And the reason why is because they are bound by the code of ethics of the you know board of the sort of you know the CFP board. So that's how you know. I would say being in the industry as long as I have, I can say with a lot of confidence that if you are working with an independent advisory firm, what's so it's known as an RAA in the industry, a registered independent advisor. If you are working with an independent advisory firm that is not working with, you know, not it's not one of these large companies, I can say in full confidence that you are working with a fiduciary that is putting your interest ahead of their own. Um, if you are working with sort of one of the large companies or a large insurance firm, I would be, I would just be honest, I would be weary. I would be weary that they have goals that they are trying to meet, um, that they are beholden to, that they, that it's in the back of their mind. I'll, well, I'll, I'll say that. And I think there's times when you see certain language and behaviors being used, right? So you go into it and they start asking, well, how many of your friends and family can I also help? Suddenly that seems much more like that seems salesy, right? You're just moving on to the next referral or everyone needs some whole life product or everyone needs a new. It's like all like this, this thought process of this is applicable to everyone. You know, may, you could probably come up with a suitability argument as you've kind of described, but is it appropriate? Is it the best thing for them? Not maybe, maybe it is. I think that's where, 
that difference here, and I kind of want to drill more into like the other things you've noticed as being different, being a part of the Cook Wealth team and kind of the collaboration that we see across the firm. And I think your points about the ensemble practice is great because, yeah, we can bring sure. in those best of service experts in things and go, oh, wow, I am, this is a really good student loan problem. And Dave McDougal knows the answer to it because right. he does it all the time. This is a great business succession tax issue. So Dave, one of the things we've seen the dark era, right? What people, sure. the red flags to worry about, the things that maybe people have heard in the news have been warned about. I want to hear more of his, the, those like really cool things that are happening in a different environment where you are focused on the client and we, we have this collaborative ensemble that's working together. What are those things that you think really benefit the client that we work with and where people may be interested in finding a little bit more of a proactive financial advisor in their world? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So one of the biggest Differences that I think the cookwell difference is is that we are very goals play goals based oriented. So we are going to have a conversation with all of our clients. We have a goal goal plan planning meeting where we look at every financial goal that you have, and it could be I mean retirement's always the big one, right? It's always like I need to, and no one wants to work forever, so yeah, let's go ahead and have to save for retirement. But we're having conversations with clients about, hey, I want to I want to buy a car. I want to buy a car every few years. How do I solve for that? There's college planning. There's those are big ones as well. I want to start a business. All these different you know, goals that you have, we want to know every single one of them. And we want to make sure that we're solving for every single one of them. And if we're not, hey, here are the recommendations to go ahead and get you there. So no goal is too, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to clients where I'm like, give me more. Like, there's got to be more. And they're like, well, I have this one thing. I'm like, that's a big deal to you. That is, that's going to give you quality of life. That's what's going to go ahead and, and you know, really make your financial plan. You, know, you feel comfortable and confident in your plan. Like let's solve for that. Right. So that's a big thing of what we do. You know, and, and, and I'll, I'll even add oh, to that is that there's also that kind of gut check where that while there is no goal too large or too small, maybe you can't have all the goals. And I think that's, that's where too. one of the things I've always seen here is that you kind of have to have a conversation and we have that relationship with people and the trust with those people to say, that sounds great. I would love if that could happen too. However, we mm -hmm. can't solve for five things with the resource constriction we have. What's the most important of those five? And really, let's focus on that. So it's not just like we can solve all your problems and make all your woes go away. I think that's been kind of the cool part is having that conversation. Going, is that really that important? Or is it like, yeah, it'd be nice if it happened. So yeah. I can't come into your firm and ask for all of my financial dreams to come true and you're not going to be able to make that happen. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> not, I, mean, I, want, we, I want to give you $5 and I want you to make me a millionaire. The Wendy, the Tesla, the <laughs> Tesla army yeah. you'll have every day, just a different car. Yes. Uh, you'll be able to kind of live in the ritziest place you want to. And, and I want to move. start with $10. 10 bucks, 10 bucks and hey, $2 can, a month after that. Work. <laughs> I, I would say that, I mean, Jason, you know about this too. Like sometimes you have to have those uncomfortable conversations and we need to give our clients, we need to be able to do that. We need to be able to have mm -hmm. those uncomfortable conversations. And another part of it too, is that I don't plan on going anywhere, right? I don't, I plan on staying at Cookwell for a very, very long time. So if I'm working with a client, I'm like, yeah, we can make all the, all your dreams come true. You're going to be able to retire with X amount of dollars and be able to start a business in 20 years. Like I'm going to be here. When all that comes, like 15 that years happens. later, like Dave, you told me I could do you everything. You told me I could You're do like, this. Like it, I plan on being here. Like that's another big thing about what we do is like our advisor turnover is, is very small. And like our, our slogan, when I first started, our, I remember looking at my business card and I flipped it over to the other side and it said building lifetime partnerships. And I was like, okay, you know, it's a pretty good slogan. It's a little cheesy, but you have to have one, right? You have to have a slogan. And the first client that I talked to, I remember our founder was like, yeah, go ahead and call her, you know, take care of an owner for 50 years. And, you know, I thought that was, you know, I'd known her for like 50 years, right? So call the client, talk to her. I'm like, yeah, you know, I started here, you know, she's like, oh, John's great. I've known her for 50 years. I was like, how long have you really known him? And she was like, well, she did the math. She's like, actually, it's been 51. So it was actually 51 years. And, and the that. deep entrenched parts of it where it's like, oh, yeah, uh, my husband taught John in basketball yes, or yes, yes, we were yes, in you know boot camp together yeah. or yeah. Oh, we met right. at this thing and there's this really rich, how do you know and the story behind it that is just so powerful, but it shows we know these clients. And I, I can tell you from my prior life, 
it, we're being a partner to CPA firm, there is so much of a drive for compliance. You know some of those stories, but it's not nearly the kind of thing that we get here where they're really entrenched into the, we're in the trenches with the client. And we've felt the pains and we've understood what they've gone through. We've helped them through it. And maybe it has nothing to do with money. I mean, how many times have you and I both been in situations where it has nothing to do with dollars and it gets into like the core of, I want to have memorable family experiences Mm -hmm. that we, those kids can go and they're equipped and they're prepared and that they, our family legacy lives on in this next generation. And how can we help do that? I mean, if I had a fainting couch, I could be a therapist at some point if I got a, the right credential to the kind of things we do here. And it's it's just so powerful. And yeah. it's so nice not having to be as focused on sales or compliance activities and not not like the regulatory ones, but just like filing tax returns. That's a part of what we do, but we're staffed appropriately to make it where that is not this, like the world stops, everyone stops. We can't help people. I've had a heard recently that someone who's CPA told him, I can't deal with you until May. I can't help you until it's convenient for me. Hmm. And guess what? In that period, there's this whole chunk of the year that life moves on. People sure. die. People are born. Things happen. Jobs change. You cannot say, just because it's tax season, I can't think about you because I'm real busy doing more stuff than I should have been doing and not putting a lot of effort into other than cranking it out. So I, uh, I, I just love that kind of collaborative, like really client entrenched focused practice that we've got here. Now you mentioned being on, you know, having your own therapist couch, you know, what kind of people skills does it take to have these kind of conversations? I mean, are you equipped for that? I can, I can take that, Jason. Yeah, I mean, I would say for, for us, it's a lot of what we do is building relationships and connecting connecting with our clients. Because Jason mentioned, like, money is, it's pretty, uh, it's not the most important thing that we talk about. It's not, right? It's talked about before about being entrenched in these clients' lives. And, you know, I don't expect to be their best. I don't expect to be everyone's best friend. There are some clients I talk to that just, you know, they see me as their financial advisor and it's very transactional and that's fine. But the majority of the clients, I mean, we really are, I always say that what we do is, while it is a professional relationship, it's one of the most intimate relationships that, that you'll have. I mean, when things happen, you know, we are, we're on the list of people to call, you know, and sometimes we're pretty high on that list. So, you know, really it's building the relationships and being able to have, you know, the respect for our clients to have conversations, like we mentioned before, those uncomfortable conversations. Sometimes we have to have those and it's, it's our duty to do that. And, you know, beyond that, it's being able to have the knowledge about you know everything in their financial world and understand their situation, but also understanding that every client's coming from a different spot. We talk a lot about meeting clients where they are in life. Sometimes the term wealth advisor can be kind of daunting. They think wealth, they're like, I don't wealth, you know, like I don't I'm not a wealth. millionaire. I'm not a millionaire. You don't have to be, right? Wealth is whatever, whatever, however you define it. There's no definition of wealth. So it's how however you define it. And we want to make sure that, you know, getting you there, you're comfortable, you're confident in your your plan. That's a big part of it too, right? Is on making sure that clients are comfortable with their plan. You know, we can, you can take a financial plan from an unemotional standpoint and say, yeah, you need to save X amount for here and do this and do this and go ahead and put your money. You need to put your money hundred percent in stocks to do the growth. We would never recommend that, but that's just a, as an example. And maybe clients doesn't feel comfortable with that, right? So we have to make sure that the plan that they sign up for, they are, you know, they can you know, they can sleep well at night, right? They, they have buy that. into that plan. Yeah. It's not just it is a not mutually just, agreed upon plan. You know, here you go. Absolutely. I foisted this onto you. Well, Dave, I very much enjoy chatting with you about these things. Sure. I, I, this is where I think the team's alignment. I'm so happy you're one of the leaders here in taking Same. that taking that mentality and getting it down to our team is just yeah. so fantastic. So I very much appreciate being on the podcast today. Sure. Wendy, I'll let you close it out for us. And yeah, we'll be talking soon, I'm sure. All right, Jason, how do people get in touch with you uh, if they have more questions or want some more information? Best place to go is to cookwealth.com or give an office a call, 919-784-9100. Thank you for joining us today. Please like, follow, and share this podcast with your friends. Until next time, I'm Wendy McConnell. 
Thank you for listening to the Own Your Wealth podcast. Click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available. Visit our website at cookwealth.com or give us a call at 919-784-9100. And don't forget to click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available. Cook Wealth Management Group, LLC, is a registered investment advisor with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Cook Wealth Management Group, LLC. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.